Uh, it's an honor to be here with everyone this afternoon, and I want to thank you for joining us both in person and remotely. Together, your participation has energized all of the events the last several days, and on behalf of the College of Charleston, I want to extend my thanks for making time to join us this afternoon. This afternoon, it is my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce our keynote speaker, the Honorable Rose Gattemüller. I told her I had been practicing all afternoon to get the correct German pronunciation, and I hope it's fairly close. Among her many accomplishments, she is the Stephen C. Hazy Lecturer at Stanford University's Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies and its Center for International Security and Cooperation. At Stanford, she teaches, mentors, and leads workshops and seminars related to her areas of expertise, including nuclear security, Russian relations, the NATO alliance, EU cooperation, and non-proliferation. Clearly, her experience and knowledge are very much needed in our world today. From 2016 to 2019, she served as the Deputy Secretary General of NATO. And during her tenure there, she helped advance NATO's strategies for combating new security challenges in Europe and the fight against terrorism. She is a leading voice on nuclear security and the management of nuclear proliferation. She served as the director of the Carnegie Moscow Center from 2006 to 2008 and is currently a non-resident fellow in Carnegie's nuclear policy program. Before her career with NATO, while Assistant Secretary of State for Arms Control, Verif Verification and Compliance, in 2009 and 2010, she was the chief U.S. negotiator of the new Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, START, with the Russian Federation. She will speak to us this evening on bringing East and West together, the legacy of John Edwin Mraz. Please join me in welcoming the Honorable Rose Gattemüller. Thank you, ma'am. That was such a kind introduction. I, uh, I have to say that I always pronounce my name with a plain old American pronunciation, Gautamore, so it's fine. <laughs> but thank you for the extra effort. It was very, very impressive. Honestly, it's good to see so many good friends uh, and colleagues, even some family here in the audience today. And it's great to see so many students here as well. And I will just put you on fair warning, the students, I love to get questions from students. So I hope that during our Q&A period, you'll be ready to put your hands up, um, either to ask me about something I've said or to ask me about anything you want. And I'll do my best to answer your questions. But um, it's really a great honor to be here with you today. Mrs. Moroz, thank you for the honor of this invitation, as well as the board members and, and uh, President Chu and, and uh, everyone who has been responsible for getting me here today, including my, my niece, uh, Jennifer Hitchcock, who is here with us today and works for the College of Charleston. So I wanted to say a special thank you to you too. So let me begin. John Ed Edwin Rose uh, founded the East West Center in 1981, just as I was beginning my professional career at the Rand Corporation. I watched with admiration as he pioneered a concept called second track diplomacy designed to bring experts together from opponent states, well-connected experts who could work problems quietly and come up with solutions to suggest to their governments. The first mission of the East-West Center, the East-West Institute, sorry, was to help address and resolve the underlying conflicts of the Cold War between the United States and the USSR. I participated in some of the early discussions that Moroz organized with the Soviets and I learned a lot from him about the value of slowly building up mutual confidence with people you don't particularly like. That's the Soviets, and it's, I have to say, the Russians today. But there is a value to quiet diplomacy in solving tough problems between opponents. And I stress that, between opponents. 
boy, could we ever use John Rose's wisdom today as we try to tackle this dreadful crisis between Ukraine and Russia. I must condemn in the strongest possible words the unwarranted invasion of Ukraine by Vladimir Putin, the president of Russia, his armed forces and special security services. Unable to achieve their original blitzkrieg goal, they are now resorting to indiscriminate killing of innocent Ukrainian civilians. What would John Rose do? That is the question I've been asking myself as I prepared this talk. To be honest, I think that track to diplomacy will have to step aside for the moment. They have a limited value as Kiev and Moscow are grappling with each other at the negotiating table. The track two has to step aside for the moment and let the two governments try to take the first steps, trying to come up, first of all, with a blanket ceasefire and with the withdrawal of Russian troops entirely from the territory that they've occupied since February 24th. When diplomacy is urgent, track two talks really must stand aside. However, I do think that there will be a role for track two diplomacy going forward. And I will come back to that uh, for the healing process. I think that's when track two diplomacy will really play an important role. And so there will be problems of peace in our time that are existential, such as problems related to nuclear weapons. So again, I want to come back to that in a little bit. But first, I would like to address how we need to think about the leaders who are driving the action during this crisis. They are the ones who will have to come up with immediate solutions, but they are not the ones to finish this story. President Biden, our president, has called Vladimir Putin a war criminal. And the Kremlin immediately shot back at him that this is unwarranted and unforgivable. It will be up to others to sort out the evidence about who is right, but I have to say the evidence currently looks overwhelming. More importantly, however, I wanted to point out that these two leaders are products of the Cold War and carry many of the shadows of that war in their hearts. Resentment over how the Cold War ended is a major source of the grievances that Vladimir Putin has been stewing in for years, which led to this barbaric invasion. Biden and Putin, critical as they are as the leaders driving action at the current moment, are of a generation that will be passing from the scene. They will not be here to watch the af aftermath as this crisis comes to a conclusion. The aftermath will unfold over the next 10, 20, even 30 years. Contrast the two of them with Volodymyr Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, 44 years old, a charismatic wartime leader, savvy at communicating with his people and people around the globe, whether they have joined the military or they are doing other things, he is also connected with his young people. He will do what it takes within the bounds that will preserve Ukraine's independence and statehood to find a peace with Russia. The way in which he has galvanized Ukrainians to fight is remarkable, as I noted, but most remarkable is the way in which he has cemented in young Ukrainians a deep commitment to their country, whether they have joined the military, the National Guard, the Medical Corps, or the Hacker Army. Ukrainian young people are fighting with will and spirit to eject the invaders. They may be afraid, but they are not backing down. It will be Zelensky and his young Ukrainians who carry forward the healing process, not Putin, not Biden, nor anyone else of the Cold War generation. What of young Russians? People have been saying that a new Cold War is emerging, that we can't deal with Russians anymore. I don't think we have to accept that. We have to embrace, I believe, as our objective, preventing new dividing lines from slamming down across Europe, separating Russia from the rest of the world. Russians must also be present in the healing process. And I was glad to see that this theme was touched on in the discussion, the panel on Ukraine and Russia this afternoon. In looking again at how to ensure stability and security for all, 
I don't think we have to accept that the abiding principles of sovereignty, independence, territorial integrity, and democratic process do not and cannot apply to Russia. To, accom to accomplish this will not be easy. The kleptocratic security service regime that has built up around Putin, the Siloviki or strongmen, will not automatically pass from the scene when Putin goes. They will be well entrenched in the Russian power structures they are today, and they are doubtless intent on replicating themselves in a new generation. We need to figure out how to get at the younger generation of Russians who want to, something better for their country. I'm thinking of people like Marina Asyanikova, the brave young woman, remember her last week, who held up the sign on, on Russian television? It said, they lie. Or the countless young people I met when I was director of the Carnegie Moscow Center from 2006 to 2008, really talented young people who are now entering the midpoints of their careers. I regret, frankly, that we have closed off ways to communicate with them by shutting down the internet and social media platforms in Russia, in some ways necessary to bolster our draconian sanctions regime, but in other ways closing them off from sources of information that are not the Putin propaganda machine. I want to propose here today that if, and I want to stress this if, we are able to achieve a stable ceasefire and the withdrawal of Russian forces from Ukraine, then we look for ways to begin unwinding sanctions that will especially help to engage young Russians to enable them to join in a peace process and a healing process with Ukraine. Just as we've used set targeted sanctions in the past as an effective tool, now we must use targeted unwinding of sanctions as an effective tool to reach young Russians. We should start by restoring mechanisms such as Apple Pay, practical payment tools that allow people to easily get onto the Moscow Metro, but also allow them to make purchases abroad. We should quickly make it possible for them to buy iPhones and software products to make updates on their current platforms. More difficult, because Putin and his cohort re will resist, they've just closed down, as you know, Meta closed down Facebook in, in Russia. But we will also, I think, uh, we should be looking at ways to restore the internet backbone that we have withdrawn along with popular social media and gaming sites. Gaming is one of the many important ways to reach young people, as I think a lot of young people in this audience can appreciate. It's a good way to communicate with the next generation and particularly with Russian young people, I think, in this case. So no matter what barriers have been thrown up by the Kremlin and will be thrown up by the Kremlin, we ought to make the internet available in any way that we can. Then we need to think about what sectors of cooperation we want to encourage. Climate change and environment will be ones that young people care about, both because of the dreadful environmental degradation that Putin's invasion has caused in Ukraine during the fighting, but also because of a big story. Russia, now cut off from the technologies that will enable it to upgrade its energy facilities, will not be able to meet its Paris carbon emissions targets. Russia will fall behind in preventing the warming of the atmosphere and the melting of the Arctic. Not only Russians and Ukrainians, but young people across the globe will care about this climate disaster. I am also hopeful, although I must say I'm not at all certain, but I am hopeful that Putin's nuclear saber rattling during this terrible crisis will attract young people across the globe to pay more attention to the need to control and limit these weapons of mass destruction. Nuclear weapons, in particular, pose an existential threat. They could bring to an end human life on this planet as we know it. The Cuban Missile Crisis captured the attention of my generation, leading to young people coming out on the streets by the millions in the 1980s to demand that nuclear weapons be controlled and eliminated. Will the current crisis have a similar effect? I don't yet know, nor do I wish for even a single nuclear bomb going off 
as Vladimir Putin has threatened. But certainly we have an opportunity now for young people to turn their attention again to the dreadful threat that nuclear weapons pose. Perhaps young Ukrainians and young Russians can lead the way. Which brings me, as I promised, back to the second track. I am quite confident that if John Edwin Rose were still alive, he would want to see the new Global Leadership Institute founded in his name here at the College of Charleston to be bringing together young people from Ukraine and Russia with students here to tackle these existential problems of war and peace. Climate change and nuclear weapons are but two critical topics to embrace. Other top topics must focus on the healing process itself. How can young Ukrainians and Russians see their way through to restoring links between their two countries, allowing families to see each other again, allowing normal ties of culture and education, and most importantly, doing a thorough study of the lessons learned so that the horrors of this invasion are not repeated. Whether it takes 10, 20, 30 years, I think that Ukrainians and Russians must be able to live together in peace once again. And I hope that the John Edwin Moreau's Global Leadership Institute will play a role in making that happen. Thank you very much for your attention. I look very much forward to your comments and questions during our discussion period. And as I warned you, I would very much like to hear from the students in this group. Thank you. Um, hello, thank you again for coming. Um, a couple months ago when Ambassador Rajibu, the Belgium ambassador to the, to the US, came and he said that the language, not literally, uh, that Russians and Americans speak at the negotiation table is, is so different, that it's not possible. Do you see that sort of diplomacy being feasible anymore? Can you say a bit more about what, what he meant? Like, what it's uh, from the earlier talk, the what Russia wants mm -hmm. isn't something we're gonna give. And there's no, it's like there's no communication between the two at these talks. Hmm. Okay. Well, of course, at the moment, I do think it's clear that these negotiations between, and the United States is not directly involved in them at the moment, the Russians and the Ukrainians are, are talking. And they do uh, seem to be at a stage where they haven't yet come to much common ground. That's always the goal of the negotiation. You often start at diametrically opposed positions, and you work slowly and steadily to come to common ground. And indeed, people have often said that the Russians are very zero-sum in their cultural attitudes. You win, I lose. I lose, you win. And it's got to be a zero-sum sum game all the time. But that's, how, that's never how a successful negotiation works. Unless, of course, you are looking at someone who's completely, completely defeated in wartime and must capitulate, essentially, which is one of the the examples from history that's often given is what happened uh, at the end of World War I uh, when the Germans you know, completely were defeated, end of World War II in some ways. But then that was a different situation because having learned the lessons of World War I, the uh, Allies decided to try to figure out a way to work with Germany to help in the reconstruction and to really drive forward to some kind of more balanced result for the future of security in Europe. It's a big question now whether we are facing that kind of choice today with, with Russia, whether you know, a demand for um, total defeat, you know, that the Russians need to withdraw. Yes, they do need to withdraw. They need to get the heck out of Ukraine, and they need to get their forces back to their operating bases and cease to threaten Ukraine's existence. But then what else is the balance going to be? Is the balance going to wall Russia off from now on? Or is the balance going to be to try to develop 
a way to, again, restore some links with Russia and cooperation with Russia. It's going to be real difficult with Vladimir Putin still in the Kremlin, but I think those are the questions we need to ask ourselves now. Because I, I fear that the real, you know, size and heft of Russia in the Eurasian uh, continent will mean that uh, if there is not some kind of healing process that occurs and we come to some ability to work with them, then we are going to be facing war again and again and again in Eurasia. Uh, so I think that's, those are the kinds of questions we need to be asking ourselves, but it's not ever for us to submit to a zero-sum approach. It's, I have my interests, I clearly define them. You have your interests, of course you've clearly defined them. How can we bring those interests together and mesh them up? So those are the kinds of questions I think we need to be thinking through. It's interesting, even today, we can see that the Russians have begun to make some concessions. Uh, when <laughs> Putin launched his blitzkrieg, he was intent on getting to Ukraine, I'm sorry, into Ukraine, but getting to Kyiv you know, within 24, 48 hours and assassinating Zelensky, removing his government and putting in place a puppet regime. I'm sure he'd still love it if that could happen, but Zelensky has, and his government have stood up so well up to this point that Putin has changed his tune now. He's not talking about regime change in Ukraine. He's negotiating with the Zelensky government. So I think, you know, already we can see that the Russians have started to make some concessions. So that's what we need to look for, that they continue to make concessions now, because as I said, they have to get the heck out of Ukraine. That's all there is to it. There's another question. Oops, go ahead. So uh, my question is, what do you think the compromise would be? Because I know in all great negotiations, there's always someone's giving up something on both sides. So do you think it's going to be more of a giving, Ukraine gives up some territory where the Russians leave and take all their troops out? Or do you think it's more of a, the Ukraine promising not to join NATO? Well, it seems again, and the Ukrainians have started to make some concessions on their side, and President Zelensky has already articulated that he is willing uh, to drop uh, the notion of NATO membership. I think one of the important questions now is, is it drop NATO membership forever or drop NATO membership until Vladimir Putin passes from the scene? <laughs> See, that's another reason why I think it's so important to effect a uh, positive, a proactive healing process with the younger generation so that the younger generation of Russians, they don't care whether Ukraine's an independent country or not. They're just happy, you know, if they can talk to Ukrainians and visit their U Ukrainian friends. They have not got this idée fixe that, that Putin's got, that he's got to turn, you know, Ukraine into part of a Slavic heartland. So uh, I think if, if we can get beyond this and get beyond this, uh, this current uh, leadership in Russia, then I think we do have the possibility for coming to some important important compromises, but it will take time. It will take a lot of time. So I can't tell you where the Ukrainians are going to come down on the issue you raised, which is territorial concessions. Will they be willing to say Crimea is forever, you know, part of Russia now and the Donbass, Donetsk and Luhansk, the east, eastern part of the country for now ever, uh, forever part of, of Russia? I can't tell you if that's where they'll come down. Uh, it's up to them to the decide that. But I, I do want to stress uh, that for the 70 years that the USSR existed, the Baltic states, the three Baltic states, we never recognized that they were part of the USSR. If you looked at a map of the USSR in those days, a US map, like from National Geographic or something, there was a dotted line and there was always a notation the United States does not recognize the Baltic states, other countries as well, as part of the USSR. Today, the Baltic states are full up members of NATO and full up members of the EU. So that's what I say, you know, even if the Ukrainians decide they must now make territorial concessions, I say, it doesn't necessarily have to be forever. We see what happened to the Baltic states after the Cold War.
Thank you. Um, the, this was a great, uh, great talk, and I really appreciate you taking the time. I wanted to ask, it picks up a little bit on the previous question about the role of NATO. You mentioned um, the ongoing resentment about the end of the Cold War, and it seems that NATO becomes sort of the, the vector for a lot of that resentment. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit about the role you see NATO playing um, past crisis management and into this reconciliation process um, projecting into the future for Europe. It's a great week to ask that question since there's a NATO summit meeting on, uh, on March 24th where all the presidents and prime ministers will be getting together to discuss, I think, that very question. Uh, frankly, I don't have any insider information about what's on the agenda, but I would recommend that they talk about three things. The first one is the very issue you raised. How can they sustain this coherence that they have formed this real strong consensus that everyone must work together and work together hard to continue supporting both the military effort in Ukraine and the humanitarian effort uh, in and, and in Ukraine, with Ukraine, but also with the NATO members who are strongly impacted, such as Poland. So I think that's, that's definitely got to be goal number one. Goal number two, I think we'll have to do something with uh, a, a firm and clear statement about the consensus and its longevity, that this consensus is here to stay, that we will continue to work hard together to ensure NATO's existence into the future, but also to ensure that the principles for which NATO stands, territorial integrity, sovereignty, principles of democratic practice, I mentioned them in my talk, but remain at the heart of what we stand for. And that will be a strong statement, I'm sure, as well. But the third statement, uh, I think, or the third objective will be to look for the future and think about how NATO can play in some kind of resolution, where we go from here, particularly on European security architecture. We had a complete system of conventional arms control, predictability, and confidence building measures, now pretty much, you know, uh, shot full of holes. <laughs> Sadly, I didn't mean that. It's not a very good joke, but um, it's, it's in uh, dire straits. But thinking about the future and sustaining stable and predictable relations with Russia going forward means thinking again about refurbishing the European security architecture and what will that take. So I think there will be a lot of thinking going on among the NATO leaders about that, and something will be said about it going forward. Um, you mentioned a lot about how uh, Ukrainians and Russians the, of the younger generation are going to be a part of the healing process and how they're at the core of what we can do to make sure we don't suffer under a conflict like this again. But given the fact that many Russians live under a time of such mass censorship under Putin, how do you think we can begin building a foundation for these conversations? Yes, let me start with a couple of, um, I think, practical things which um, I, uh, well, I think are gonna be really important. We have here the president of the National Endowment for Democracy, he's around here somewhere, um, but at least maybe he had to go. But uh, anyway, uh, the National Democratic Institute, which is under the N NED uh, and works very closely with them, for example, is looking for ways to provide virtual private networks to Russians who no longer, by the way, have a Visa or MasterCard. They don't have a way to pay for a VPN. So NDI is looking for quiet ways to help the Russians get VPNs. So there, there are some really practical things like this that uh, I think are, are important to, uh, to implement now and to look for ways to implement in a very um, pragmatic way as well, a very practical way, because I, I talked about restoring internet backbone and that type of thing. And it's going to be um, difficult to do, given the way, you know, frankly, the, <laughs> we have the Great Wall of um, China, right? Uh, the internet wall slammed down. And I think, oh, there he is. <laughs> I was just giving you a shout out. So, ha ha, I caught you. <laughs> no, I was just talking about ways to encourage uh, restoration of some ties in in Russia with things like affecting uh, 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 VPNs, helping, helping individuals get VPNs and that type of thing. So I do think that there are ways you know, to do this, but it ain't gonna be easy, as I mentioned, because of the way now Putin is slamming down a great internet wall in Russia again. So it's, gonna it's going to take the imagination and the 
the knowledge of you young people in this room to help make this happen, figure out all these ways that we can uh, facilitate communication and interaction despite the fact that a great internet wall might be slamming down. I'm not 100% certain how this is gonna work for the Russians because they do depend on us a lot already uh, for software and a lot of that is already inserted in their own, in their own system. Yes, please go ahead. Hi, thank you. You mentioned the issue of the kind of European security architecture. Uh, in the context of strategic ambiguity, uh, where the decision was made to say what we would not do if the Russians came into Ukraine, um, obviously in World War II, it, the Nazis took country after country and nobody made a decision about where to draw the line. Right. Now we've, at least in some sense, we've drawn the line that if you attack a NATO country, we will act. But there are a lot of countries that aren't in NATO. Uh, what should we be doing now for countries, or at least sending a message regarding countries like Moldova and others, if we are going to do something to stop if, if there were to be another invasion? Yes. Well, the reality of the situation is there's a long-standing, people are asking me a lot about red lines right now, and the, re the reality of the situation is there is a red line that is 70 years old, and it is called the Washington Treaty and it is the foundational document of the NATO alliance in which is set out that if a country is in a member of NATO in Article 5 of that treaty and that country is invaded and it asks for help, then all member states of NATO must come to its aid. Article 5, the all for one and one for all article of the Washington Treaty. But it is a red line that applies to NATO, just as you point out. So what we can do now, for one thing, I think it's very clear that the Russian army is failing at what it's doing in Ukraine. It doesn't mean that Vladimir Putin is not going to try to uh, accelerate the offensive and do everything he can to cause the Ukrainians still to capitulate. But I think that we can be very clear that the kind of standing up for our principles that we see visible in our assistance to Ukraine will be available to others as and if the Russians invade further. I know there's a lot of concern out there. You mentioned Moldova, that Moldova uh, could be next. So I think we need to be clear. First of all, just on the level of this is barbaric behavior and you are creating yourself, you're digging yourself in even further as a, as I called it in a, an article last week, a very big pariah state with nuclear weapons, but you're digging yourself in further as being cut off from the uh, practice uh, of you know, proper international legal law and, uh, and the rule of law in the international system. And that means you know, the, the international system turns its back on you uh, with the sanctions that we see directed against Russia now but then also turns its face to those in need of help to the countries that are invaded. And so I think we just have to continue if, if Russia continues to operate uh, as Hitler and the Nazis did, we have to be really very firm on those points and do what we can. I, I have to be honest, I, I'd be interested if there are others around the room particularly those of you who have been in the military and are observing this more with a military eye, but it's clear to me that the Russian army are not the panzer divisions of Nazi Germany. They are running out of gas and running out of steam. And I think they're running out of ammo too, but I'd be interested if others around the room want to comment on that, what, what you think. Hi, thank you so much for your comments. Um, I mean, with regards to the last, I'm not in the military, but from what I understand that they're not, their supply chains are not set up as well as the US military in terms of um, like their, their fuel stops. They, they didn't allot the amount of fuel that they needed to get into Ukraine in and out. And so their supply chains are just not organized as well as the US military, for example. I think that's one of their um, major strategic failings. And then the other part you all know is that, you know, they grabbed 18 year old kids who didn't even know they were going to Ukraine to fight and then all of a sudden they're texting their moms being like, I'm at war, this is bad, I'm supposed to kill Ukrainians and they don't want us here. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean that's just I think a few things with regards to the military. Um, uh, 
my question is with regard to NATO obviously saying that it will not implement a no-fly zone. Um, and um, I host a show called Samantha Politics. It's about global politics. I've done numerous shows on Ukraine with Ukrainians on the ground. And um, it's just quite hard for me to even think forward to like healing processes when every single moment that we're here, people are dying. Um, and being bombed and we can have lots of you know great development organizations and lots of humanitarian organizations running around on the ground but there there's a reason it's closed the sky it's because this is where people are dying it's from the sky and so I don't know the answer to this question um, you know we talked before about you know do we supply more and more and more um, fighter jets uh, but but you know I know NATO intervened with Kosovo in 99. Obviously, Milosevic and Serbia was not a nuclear power. However, they were allied with Russia, and it did finally put an end to Milosevic and all of his crap. Um, you know, so I, I'm not sure what my question is here, but I just feel like we need to be doing more, and that if NATO really stands for sovereignty and territorial integrity, you know, how can we kind of stand by and let Russia just rampage through the country? Thank you. Okay, thank you. The very powerful, very powerful comments. And um, let me go at it a couple ways just again, and I will appreciate further debate and discussion on this. As I see NATO's responsibilities at the moment, it is to prevent this war from turning into a general war in Europe. And NATO has been very good in the way it is helping Ukraine. By the way, NATO supply chains are really good. They keep the flow of armaments up as well as humanitarian assistance in to Russia, I'm sorry, oh heavens, into Ukraine, coming from various directions, from Poland, from Hungary, from Romania. So they have a number of, of ways that they are getting things into the country and doing so in an incredibly, I think, skilled and imaginative way. So I'm glad that that is, that is keeping up. So NATO is doing what it can to support Ukraine, but, if this war turns into a general war in Europe, I am very concerned about escalation and escalation even to the nuclear level. So I think that is a, an important reason to think about how NATO continues to avoid actually shooting at Russians. And so I think it is very important if the Russians shoot at NATO, NATO will defend itself, but to keep this war from turning into World War III. That's NATO's strategic objective at the moment. But let me talk about your goal of a no-fly zone. You are right. Death is raining down on Ukrainians from the sky. But the Russians have not been operating aircraft over Ukraine. These are missile attacks, most of which are being perpetrated from inside Russia. The attack on the, uh, the base near Lviv a week ago, last uh, weekend, that Russian experts have told me was launched from heavy bombers flying over Russia. It was an air-launched cruise missile strike that was flown uh, over, from over Russia. So they are being very careful not to bring their own aircraft into Ukrainian airspace. So what the Ukrainians have is not an air superiority problem where you need a no-fly zone. What they have is an air defense problem. And so I am very, very glad. By the way, I think this is going to be, to your question, this is going to be the, one of the things that's discussed on Thursday, how to get more air defense capability to the Ukrainians. And I was really glad to see last week that the Slovaks, for example, apparently have agreed to send the S-300 system, which is a Russian-built system, but a very good air defense system that the Slovaks happen to have to send that to Ukraine. So we need to continue to think about surface-to-air missiles. We need to continue to think about missile defense of all kinds. But that's another reason why I argue that we kind of, I think, got too wrapped around the axle on the notion of a no-fly zone. It's not what the Ukrainians need right now. They need missile defense. Oh, hi. Um, thank you again so much for coming. My question was um, more to your service as our Deputy Secretary of NATO, and specifically, like, what ways 
you were able to incentivize diplomacy between our NATO nations, but also beyond in surrounding countries in Europe as well. Thank you. That's an absolutely great question because um, I was serving at NATO as uh, NATO uh, Deputy Secretary General between 2016 and 2019. And um, you will be aware that this was the period when President Trump was, was the President of the United States and he was extremely tough on NATO. He wanted the NATO allies to pay their fair share in terms of the defense burden. And the NATO allies have promised to spend 2% of their gross domestic product on missile, no, missile defense, on, uh, on defense overall. And it was very interesting during that period how rattled they were uh, because President Trump was so insistent on this. Frankly, the Secretary General, Jens Stoltenberg and I, both agreed that they needed to be pressed to spend more on defense. And Jens Stoltenberg had a very, I think, good working relationship with President Trump to get the allies to spend more on defense. It's frankly taken this crisis to get you know, the numbers up now where even Germany is saying finally that it's willing to spend 2% of its GDP on defense. But it was a delicate matter during that period, the negotiations among the allies uh, and between the leadership of NATO, Secretary General and I and the rest of the international staff of NATO and the countries to say, hey, you really, really, the President of the United States is serious. You really have to spend more on defense. So it was a, it was a delicate time, but uh, I think even during that period, we were able to achieve a significant amount of success, and it, uh, it produced some, some very good results in the end of the day. But it is uh, an organization that operates by consensus, the NATO Alliance, and that means every single day you are working slowly and assiduously with every single NATO member to ensure that they can come to, to a consensus on every single decision. And sometimes it's like watching grass grow. It can be long and very arduous. But I'm impressed at how well and how fast NATO has responded in this crisis, and the European Union as well. So if there's anything that I would say to Vladimir Putin if I had a chance to talk to him after I condemned his invasion of Ukraine, but I would say, look, you have actually driven the NATO allies together in a way that they have never been so closely working together and has have such a strong consensus to support Ukraine. So I think that's um, an interesting phenomenon of the current of the current crisis that he has driven both NATO and the EU countries to work better together than they have for many years in the past. If I could just say the last thing, because a lot of people really talked about how Trump was so insistent on defense spending coming up at NATO. Every single US president since John F. Kennedy called the NATO allies freeloaders. There's a great National Security Council meeting report from 1962 where President Kennedy said, I am tired of these freeloading European allies. They need to be spending more on their own defense. So this has been a bipartisan issue both sides of the aisle, presidents of the Democratic and the Republican Party, very insistent on this matter, but honestly, it's taken Vladimir Putin of Russia in the end of the day to make this uh, policy truly, I think, uh, develop in a, in a significant way. Uh, of your very many achievements, I think one has been left out here of this uh, program, and that is your lead role in the negotiations in 1994 to get the uh, nuclear weapons away from uh, Belarus and the Ukraine into, uh, into uh, Russia at that time. It would be very interesting to hear in view of what you did then, because you were the, that was a great achievement. How do you look at that today? Thank you. It's an excellent question and a, a very, for me, um, heartrending question in many ways because what we did at the time of the breakup of the Soviet Union, there were th uh, three countries, not Russia, that still had nuclear weapons on their territory. And Ukraine had over a thousand nuclear warheads and significant nuclear delivery vehicles, missiles, bombers, etc., to deliver those nuclear warheads. 
Yes, there's a start, <laughs> 1994, the START Treaty back then. Um, but uh, we, and frankly, the I would say the world community as a whole were very, I think, uh, well-minded that what we didn't want to see from the breakup of the Soviet Union was two things. The first was that nuclear weapons from the Soviet, Soviet nuclear arsenal should not fall into the hands of terrorism, of terrorists. Or not, or state actors uh, such as you know the North Koreans who would use them to malign purposes. We were afraid they were going to be sold on the black market. So from that concern arose something called the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program. Senators Nunn and Lugar sponsored it. We worked very well with Russia and with the other countries of the former Soviet Union to get those weapons under control. But the second thing that came out of it was a decision that there should be only one successor state as a non an NPT, non-proliferation treaty, nuclear weapon state, and that should be Russia, so that Russia should take over the role of a nuclear weapon state under the non-proliferation treaty, and that Ukraine, Kazakhstan, and Belarus would become non-nuclear weapon states under the NPT. And we had to convince them that that was a good idea, and particularly in Ukraine, there was some view that they should hold on to their nuclear weapons and turn them basically into an independent nuclear force. That would not be easy. It would not have been easy because all those systems were attached to command and control centers in Moscow. They would have had to guillotine the command and control and build up their own command and control in Ukraine. So as to how I feel about it today, obviously a lot of people are saying Ukraine should have held on to those nuclear weapons. It's a very difficult matter watching what is happening now. But I will say to you that what we said to the Ukrainians at the time was that you will immediately become a nuclear pariah state and you will not get the cooperation you need and which we promise we will help to implement, the cooperation you need to become a healthy economy, a self-standing democracy, a true independent and sovereign country. Work with us to do this, and we will ensure that you are on that road. So what the Ukrainians bought by giving up their nuclear weapons and joining the non-proliferation treaty as a non-nuclear weapon state was 30 years of stability to become the country they have become now, fighting for their lives. They would not be where they are today with this very committed group, as I said, from the highest, President Zelensky, to the young people fighting in the fields, they would not be the country they are today if they had held onto those nuclear weapons. And in fact, in my view, they would have been under immediate pressure from Russia and probably very well might have resulted in a nuclear conflagration earlier. That's my own personal view. Others may feel differently. I don't believe we're headed for nuclear conflagration today, by the way. Uh, I am concerned about some limited nuclear weapons use, perhaps, but I think we need to do everything we can to prevent that, too. So that's my answer, but I'll be honest with you, I feel quite saddened <laughs> by where we are with this happening in the way it has. Hi, thanks so much for being... Oh, there's a quick follow-on. Yes, the question is, uh, the nuclear command and control, as, as I mentioned in my remarks, was centered in Moscow. President Yeltsin had the nuclear suitcase, the nuclear command and control, you know, in his hands. And all the other countries, they didn't have really the means to access those nuclear weapons. As I mentioned, the Ukrainians would have had to try to guillotine the command and control center, command and control links to Moscow, and build up their own then indigenous command and control system for the for the nuclear uh, arsenal in their own country. So um, 
I think that certainly was an argument that we used with Ukrainians that this was going to be technically very, very challenging for them to accomplish. I'm not saying they couldn't have done it, but they would have been in a situation where they weren't getting any help to do it. That's for sure. Question? Hi, thanks so much for being here. How do you uh, see this current conflict in, in Russia and Ukraine affecting a potential conflict in, in Taiwan? Um, do you think that the, the isolation uh, from the international community to Russia will deter China enough from ever doing uh, that sort of thing, or um, do you see it differently? Thanks. It's a really great question. A lot of people have been watching with great interest what China is up to right now and really um, wondering, you know, are the Chinese going to help facilitate? I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall for President Biden's uh, long phone call with President Xi the other day. But there's a lot of questioning, where is China going to come down? in this crisis. And I really, again, I'll welcome comments from China experts in the audience, but I've been very, very taken by a number of China experts who have said recently that basically this has, this uh, crisis over Ukraine and the way the, the Russians are taking a beating, a pounding from the rest of the international community with this major sanctions regime being, being really locked down on them that uh, in the end of the day, this has uh, really blown holes in Xi's what appears to be early ambition. It was an early ambition to launch a military strike on, on Taiwan. So at least that's what I hear from China experts. So I do believe that there was and uh, will be an impact on Chinese decision-making with regard to Taiwan out of this whole affair, number one. But number two, the... Um, Interesting question for me, and I've been arguing, um, if we can't be working with Russia, because Russia is now, uh, you know, as I said, a very big pariah state with nuclear weapons, can we get the Chinese to be more active in working on global regimes, again, like the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty regime? They are members of the regime, non -nu or nuclear weapon states under the regime. Can they actually help now to save the regime in the context of this Russian bad behavior? So. There are questions that I have out there. Will the Chinese you know, now take on more of an international leadership role, essentially, or will they revert uh, to more mischief making? We'll have to see. Hi, my name is Christina Farrell, and I'm an international studies um, double major and a French double major with a minor in Russian studies with plans to pursue a career in diplomacy. And I just wanted to know, um, how, what path you took to get to this career, um, get to the place you are in your career, and then also how you dealt in a um, male-dominated um, environment. It is the reality of the situation, isn't it? Um, well, people often ask me if I had a strategic plan, but I have to say I was lucky, uh, and I had some good opportunities uh, that came my way. So I always say when young people ask me this question, both young women and young men, I say, look for good risks to take. And, uh, you know, and your generation, it will be natural for you to jump around. You will be going from job to job to job. You're never, you know, gonna get, um, I think, into a, a job like in, uh, you know, the Department of Defense where you stay there for 40 years. I know very many respected colleagues around the room have had uh, long careers in a single organization, but it's not gonna be the way this generation works. I don't think it'll be the way you have your career. And in fact, interestingly, I, I'm a good friend with Bill Burns, who's now the director of the CIA. And that's a place where people generally have gone in at the entry level and then spent their career there. But people don't want to do that anymore, young people. So he's really grasping for ways to try to figure out, can we do something where people could come into the CIA for a couple of years, then go out and work you know, in Silicon Valley for a while, and then maybe come back? And, it's gonna be hard, especially for that organization with their clearance requirements and so forth. But, but there is that urge, I think, even in the big government agencies now to look for ways to enable what will be a more footloose uh, generation to be able to build their careers in the way I was lucky enough to build my career, going from think tank to government work, back to think tank, to the international organization of NATO over, over time. It is facilitated in our culture and in, in our economy because we have, even in government service, something called the revolving door, 
where if you are a political appointee, you can work for a president and then you can go back to work in a think tank and maybe then come back to work for another president in future. So that revolving door at the upper level, I think works very well. And cult so culturally, we have that openness to these kinds of ideas. But what I like to say is take good risks. If something comes your way and you're not quite sure about it, when the Rand offer came up back in 1978, I thought, hmm, part-time research assistant. Hmm, I'm, I'm not sure I can live on this, but I've got some money in the bank. I want to go to grad school anyway. I'll do it. And it turned out to be a great decision because I had a fantastic mentor there. Mrs. Rose was telling me about her mentoring activity, and, and I, I was really lucky to have a great mentor in the, in the uh, name of one uh, Thomas Wolfe, who was their senior Soviet military analyst at the time. And he really, you know, pushed me hard, um, but uh, he also, I think, helped then to open further doors for me to stay at RAND and work on other projects. So it was a good risk. It was a good risk that I took. And so that's why I say um, something comes along. If there's a safe bet and a good risk, take the good risk. I don't think you'll regret it. If we may, uh, one more question, Stephen. Thank you very much. I, I'm, my question is a point of clarification. Um, in your very good presentation, I understood you to say that there isn't really an air war over Ukraine with fixed-wing aircraft. But there is a report in the New York Times today that the Ukrainians have numbers that they've shot down 97 fixed-wing aircraft over Ukrainian skies. Uh, my understanding is uh, that these are not large fighter jets, that they are shooting down drones and things like that. They, they have a list of all the fighter jets they've shot down. Okay, well then I'm uh, in error. But what I'm talking about is, uh, is really not, as I said, in the majority, um, an air superiority problem. It is uh, really going after these missiles. Now, the thing that I have been concerned about, and perhaps uh, what is happening uh, is an escalation of the Russian, uh, the Russian initiative to carpet bombing, which I really have been worried and concerned about. So perhaps that's what we are seeing. But it all, that air defense capability that we have been piling into Ukraine and the anti-aircraft capability that we have been piling into Ukraine is going to help with that problem as well. Someone said, oh, I know it was Doug Lute the other day. He said, this is establishing air, uh, basically a no-fly zone from the ground up. And I really think that that uh, is uh, quite important, the way that we have uh, gone about getting that, that capability to them quickly. Yes, I agree. Thank you. I, I'm very worried about the potential for carpet bombing. About carpet bombing, yeah. yes, exactly. Madam Secretary, thank you so much for your insight and uh, for, for your keynote address and for your questions, for your patience with uh, our students and our guests. And please join me for a round of applause. And I also want to thank to all, to all of you for coming here for this keynote address. This completes, uh, concludes our formal program of the Moroz Global Leadership Institute inaugural convening. Thank you for coming and have a good night. Thanks for the great questions.